What's up, y'all? This is Master P with Hip Hop DX. Keep it locked. We in a building. I grew up on uh, Master P like most of us. Yeah. And uh, my favorite project is the True Project, True to the Game. All right. Like, that's the one. So I, I really want to get into that project because I got these uh -huh. questions I've had forever. Uh -huh. um, first one is uh, the No Limit Soldiers. Yeah. I guess it's track two on uh, disc one. That, those keys on there are so mm -hmm. iconic now. Yeah. How was that? I know, I know Beast by the Power produced the project. Yeah, KL, KLC. How'd that yeah. go? It was good. I mean, at that time, KL was probably in his prime, just making incredible music. He's always been my favorite. And uh, I mean, once we get in the studio and I hear something, it just come. A lot of those records just came. The magic came after what we done been through on the streets. And, you know, I got the whole soldier thing from my grandfather. My grandfather was in the military and uh, he ended up losing his life to, uh, uh, they gave him the wrong medicine in, at the VA hospital. And so my grandfather always was like, man, you know, I didn't get the $10,000 that they were supposed to give me to go get me a house. You, you know, you need to start your own on me. And so when he passed, that just stuck with me. That's going to be in the movie. That's going to be in the King of the South Ice Cream Man movie. And you'll see, you know, how that really started. And just about drive, man. We talk about No Limit Soldiers. We, we, we knew back then the Ghetto Boys had the best music. Uh, NWA had the best music. But we felt like something was missing in hip hop. We, we felt like that New Orleans bounce, make you jump around and, and, and get up, that was missing. So people always tell me when you're going to start a business, you got to find something missing. By me having a retail store, you know, I, I thought the music was just all riding music at the time. That was, that was the biggest music. And I said, I'm going to put some move into it, make people get up and dance and jump around. That's, what it did. That's exactly what happened. I yeah. mean, like, I was at a lot of clubs and a lot of fights would go down on yeah. some, yeah. some yeah. two tracks, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, do you remember when, like, the first time you heard, those, heard that beat, heard the production? Like, did, did the rhymes come after that? We'll say that. Did the rhymes come after you heard the beat? Did you guys already have that? Now, I think we, we made the horns, and then I, I, come, I put the hook to it, and then he just... Fatten it up. That's, that, that's what KL did. Some songs he made, and then I, once I heard it, I, I said, I got something to it. Uh, but that particular song, I think, uh, you know, being on the road, you know, I was out there with Tupac. I was out there with uh, Spice One, MC8, uh, E-40, Too Short. And I felt like they all had their own sound. You know, when we made that record, I felt like we created our own sound. And I, I could tell by being on a bus with all these guys that was big at that time, it did something to everybody. You know, when I, when I cut that song on, it did something. It, it made people, because you know, people was on our music a little bit, but when that came and make them say, uh, it, it changed what they, what they thought about me as an artist. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like we really introduced ourselves to the world, because we had, we had East Coast people jumping around, West Coast, Midwest, down South, everybody fell in love with that. You know, that whole era was so sample heavy, obviously, but it was a new kind of sample. I, I feel like the bad boy sample, Diddy sample, where you just kind of you yeah. take a song and then you yeah. keep the hook yeah. basically intact, but put the yeah. verses on it. Yeah. There's a lot of that on that project. Like, when yeah. I think about songs like, like Feds, yeah. you know. Um, well, you know, I mean, we did that at that time, you know, it was like going into the crates of records and grabbing the best songs and being able to flip it. You know, and I think that's what we was able to do good. Flip some stuff that, that might have been a singing record and turn it into a street record. It made, it, made sense with, with the cold of the streets. Right. So, yeah. Where'd you guys spend uh, most of the time recording the tracks for that project? In Baton Rouge. So we, 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 we built the studio in Baton Rouge. What happened was, you know, I was in, when I first started, I started out in Richmond, California with, with K. Lou. But once Mayor X and them got out there in KLC, we was like, we making good music. And, and you know, I, I even was doing music with EA Ski. You know, he did a lot of Spice One records. But I was like, something missing. I feel like, like I need to go home, you know? And that's what we did. It was like watching that Rocky, I had a tiger, like, you gotta go back and go. So I was like, I learned everything I learned from the Bay, how to hustle. Oakland, Frisco, I've been everywhere. But at the same time, I felt like, I had to go and do me. So when I got home, all the magic just, just came because you're around 
what you normally do. You know, I had I had one 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 of my partners, King George, I used to hang with. He was from New Orleans too, so I used to hang with him in the Bay. But I told him, man, I'm going home and going to do with everybody else. You know, they was like, man, I'm chilling. I'm like, I'm gone. And I, and that's that's basically what I did. That's how it happened. I, I got the game from the Bay, and I took that hustle, independent hustle game, to the South. And I watched what the Ghetto Boys and uh, what James Prince did with rap a lot. I learned the business side. So I'm like, I seen a black man running a record company. I said, that's where I need to be at. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to do a record deal. My first deal, I went to Jimmy Iovine. They offered me a million dollars. Turned it down, jumped back on the plane. I only had $500 in my pocket. Me and C about to fight, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I'm turning down a million dollars. But I felt like I was making history. I knew that I was worth more than that. You know, if this guy going to give me a million dollars, it got to be worth 40 whatever but that's how I feel you know but then I know I had to go back home and work hard you know when they they told me man you gonna get no deal in this town if it ain't with us you know because they had Suge they had uh, Puffy at the time they had everything and I just felt like I had to do it on my own so what projects were you pushing when you were talking to Jimmy Iovine when he offered you to do? I think I mean I had the ice cream man record but you know it was like Cause I was selling independently already, so but I had that Ice Cream Man record. That was gonna be my big, you know, project to 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 enter the the music game. And uh, I mean, you know, when I did the deal and I I ended up getting a deal with Priority, which was a distribution deal. I think people didn't think it was gonna happen, you know. So and I got that from the whole Michael Jackson attorney told me, you know, you need a distribution deal. That's an eighty twenty deal but you're gonna need 200 for marketing and promotion. You know, by me going to college, you know, I'm a hood dude that went to college, so I'm like, you know what, it's stuck in my mind. I ain't know what it was at the time, but I just kept screaming, I need a distribution deal, that's it. So I finally got somebody to get that to me, which was priority, and I had the marketing money. And so, I mean, that's how I did it. And you know, that's how anybody that's thinking that you need a major company, you don't. You know, you just gotta believe in yourself, you gotta get, be willing. I was out there putting up posters, on my own, I was hitting the streets, you know. Uh, I got into my car and people thought I was crazy because I was like, I'm gonna make this work, but I gotta do the marketing myself. So I hit every city, jumped, I made a No Limit van, started passing out CDs and T-shirts and putting up my own posters. I, I was like the Avon man, you know, they had the Avon later back in the days. I'm like, I'm getting out here touching everybody. And that's, you know, if you really want something, it's like playing basketball. You really want something, you got to put the work in, get in the gym. And that's, that's what I did. I believed in myself. And I, I feel like I had one, I, I tell people the story all the time. So I was on tour with Tupac in Cincinnati and they got into with somebody. They had to leave. But that first time I was there, I did that show. I was the opening act. They would say, Mr. P, the country singer. They ain't even know. You know, they see me with gold teeth, figure this man, he you know, and I'm telling the dude, man, look, you better get this right, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I had one fan at that time. I don't know if he was drunk or whatever, but they was waiting to see Tupac, you know? But man, what Tupac is? So I did my little opening act, but I had one dude jumping around with me, and I said, I'm gonna turn that into millions, that one person. That's when I really believed that, okay, I really could do this, so. That's crazy. Yeah. When's the last time you listened to that? Do you listen to your old work? Yeah, I mean, you know, now that I started back doing shows and stuff, so people are requesting songs, so I get my DJ, you know, now I got to really get back into, you know, the bigger the show, the, the bigger I'm going to give them, you know, the, the pass. So, you know, but it's good, though, going in clubs, checking it out. But it feel, feel funny because, like, the, the younger generation know all my old music and they, they catching on to this new music. So I, I did uh, the Freaky Song in the club last night. I did a concert in Baton Rouge for Southern uh, uh, Homecoming. And they went crazy. They was like, they own it, they feeling it, you know. Some people don't know the record, some people do know the record. I mean, I had somebody at the college, oh, P, you, you redid Future Record. I said, really? <laughs> but I like it, I'm like, you know what? Big shout out to Future, man. I mean, you know, it's like, I want this generation to take what I'm doing and flip it. Cause I think it's, I think it's great. When people think of you, that mean that, that you did something right. 
So, you know, I, I, I was, it was funny to me, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then once they, they, they got on their phone quick and said, hold up, when P had a Freak Holes record off the True record, that was way back in the 90s, they, they was like, oh, I'm sorry. I said, nah, that's, it's good, you know what I'm saying? That, that mean that we all think, because I, I, I did this record maybe about, maybe about like a year ago, but I'm like, I'm gonna find a good time to put it out. It is good. That Freakos record was huge too, yeah. man. That was another big one, big yeah. one. Off there. Like that was one of my favorite. That was my yeah. favorite part of the club when yeah. the Freakos yeah. came out. Yeah. Now I seen it last night, man. It was like crazy because the the energy in that record and what it is, you know, people just want to party, you know, and, and they don't care what you're saying. It's like lift your head back and just party, you know. And I, I like I like the new version now. I don't know why I like the new version better. Cause I mean, because of the time, but you know, we know that that record is a classic, and and whoever flip it, flip it. I'm good. One of my favorite tracks on there was uh, True Questions. Yeah. And the C Murder Joint. Yeah. I thought he yeah. slayed that all three verses. Yeah. And it clearly, it's inspired by other you know classic rap verses and, yeah. and, and rap tracks. Yeah. Was it was were, was there a point where you and Silk thought about getting on that as well, or, or was that the banners? Which is like a lot of those records we made. A lot of those records I made the hook for, and then I, I feel like that's a C record. This is Silk record, but you know, I mean, we all made records that we felt like, oh, this a P record. You know, this is Silk record. You know. Um, I mean, that's how it is when you're family. You're like, we don't care. We just want to put the records out and it turned out to be a good record, I think. That was different about us back then. We made a lot of records with all of us on it, which you looked at. That's, that's what I would claim the fame was. We supported each other. So we sold 75 million records because we rapped on whoever made a record. We didn't, we didn't trip. We like, we're going to get on it, which a lot of groups and a lot of solo artists that was big, they didn't rap on your record unless you was huge back then. So that's how we passed a lot of people up because we used ourselves as we're gonna build this brand with us. So once we got hot and we rapped, I mean, we, we had a bunch of guys that never put a record out before, they'll go go, because it had all us on it. You know, at one time we had over 20 records on the Billboard charts at one time. Which, which they told me, you know, I, 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 I was having a fight with the people in Prague. It was like, you can't put that many records out at one time. I said, why well, I can't? I own the company. You know, it's a difference, like, with, you got Ice Cube and these guys, but you could tell them what to do. You can't tell them what to do because I own the company. And they, they was like, oh, what kind of deal we got? We got a distribution deal. That's it. I tell y'all what to do. And it, it really changed the game, man. And I think that's what... That's what's going to be so powerful about that movie. Uh, when I watched the NWA movie, it showed how in hip hop, how we lost a lot. And I think with my movie, we're going to show, it's a, it's a rag to riches story, we're going to show how we was able to conquer and win. You know, my last words was with them is, when I did that deal with Brian Turner, they wrote me, they finally wrote me a big check. So, you know, when Ice Cube broke up the, the thing in the office, mine was a little bit different. So. I had them scared. It was like I say, because they didn't want to pay me either, you know, but I'm like, my boy, my people won't be up there in the morning. So they know. They was, they was scared. So, but at the end of the day, I sent an attorney and I sent an audit up there. So that's what I learned from going to school, going to college, being from the streets, but going to college. And I tell anybody all the time, you, you, you got to outthink them. You know, when I ordered them, they ended up writing me a fat check. And I said, I told them my last words was, I'm gonna open up the industry to be able to make money. Well, hip hop people are gonna be able to feed their families off of this. There ain't gonna be no more y'all robbing us and we don't get no money. We just out here for fame. And so, you know, that was, that, that was the breaking point. You know, for me to be able to cash big checks like that, it opened the doors for whoever, the cash money, the 50 cents, the Dr. Dre's, everybody, they, they wasn't cutting us those type of checks. You know, it allowed me to be able to go sign a Snoop Dogg when his career post had been over with, you know. And I was like, man, look, should my, my money don't spend, you know what I'm saying? Well, what, they, what you going to offer them? I said, well, I'm going to give you a little more. And that's, that, that's how that went. And it, it, it's incredible, man, that we was able to come from the hood to Hollywood. We was able to, to, to conquer that. Because it was a struggle at first, but I, I feel like hard work paid off.
You did, know? did you realize at the time that the moves you guys were making were going to be so pioneering going forward? Did it feel like you guys were breaking the mold? Well, you know, we was, we was always doing stuff that was out of the box. So I was in this neighborhood, I, I, you know, it was this prestige neighborhood in Baton Rouge. We, we hit all the news, all the medias. No black pers person had ever brought a house back there. I brought five houses at one time. So this, I brought a house where the governor didn't have a house like that back there. And they, they called the banks, they were saying, you're not gonna be a part of this club. We're gonna make sure, and we're gonna make sure we stop the money, the loan that you did at the bank, you would never get a house back here. Then they called him back, it was this old white guy. He answered the phone, he said, what? The houses are paid for, he didn't get a loan. They was like, what? <laughs> you know? It was like, I mean, if you get out there and work hard for something, you could do something you incredible, you know? And I mean, I, I had Snooper House back there, Mystical, Silk, C, me. I mean, I mean, we was always breaking in. And then I feel like in Baton Rouge, what was different from California, we just stuck out so big in Louisiana, you know, New Orleans. They never seen that type of success. So after a while, I said, you know what, I got I to gotta go to Hollywood. You know, this is a, it's just too much. Too much you got to deal with with the success that you have because People in the South, they weren't used to that. You know, and you were stereotyped, so. You know, um, at that time, I don't think people were crediting you guys with being tight lyrically yeah. as much as party music, much as the movement. Did that but, bother you? Well, nah, to be honest with you, you know, like for me, I got into this business to feed my family. Like you, if you question my lyrical status, that's fine. Like I tell you all the time, I mean, I never wanted to be the best rapper in the world. I wanted to make my money. And the songs I had, it's heartfelt, they real. I mean, you listen to Miss My Homie, what, what, that's, what, what, you, what you call that? You know, is that heaven for a gang? So it's just real, it depends what music you're looking for. Make them say, uh, and I mean, these records that, some of the biggest records in the world, and they still go strong today. Um, break them off something, I mean, some of the biggest records in the club right now when you go. So, I mean, it ain't about, I think to me, that's what hip hop is, is you being yourself, being a part of a culture that you kind of like an outcast, you know, you kind of like a loner when you at the top. You know, everybody gonna hate when you at the top, it don't matter. So, people gonna say whatever. Think about it, that's what you just said. I don't care what nobody say. It's like, if your conscience clear, you ain't got to worry about what nobody say, it's an opinion. That's what it is to me. So your opinion about me back then and me being a lyricist, that's your opinion. But go look up. I broke every record. Made top Forbes under 40 back then at 20 something years old. Like Coop. All the other stuff don't matter. You go stand on the stage and get a trophy. I'm going to the bank and get whatever I want. I mean, we made history. You know, it was a big thing, though. I mean, not, even, not only just No Limit, but the yeah. South in general. I mean, yeah. we're at that point, let's say 97, if we're talking about this true record. We're two years past yeah. uh, Andre 3000 speaking up at the Source Awards, yeah. right? Uh, people still hadn't credited Scarface, yeah. UGK, well, Scar with the things they'd done. Scarface, UGK, Lil Wayne. I mean, it's a lot of people that done the mystical. I mean, I mean, a lot of talent come from what we come. We opened the doors. I feel like we brought all coasts together, you know, with the music. I mean, people wanted to dance. I feel like we brought dance to, to the hip hop, to the streets. It was more like of a, ri a riding type of music thing back in the days. So even Ice Cube and them music. Put my, Nike on, my Nikes on the coffee table, you know. That was still riding music. It wasn't like we gonna go in a club and tear it up. So, I mean, I like to make music that the women could dance to. That's where the wobble wobbles and all that stuff come from. But you know, that was our, you gotta find a niche. Feel like we made street music and then that girls could relate to it. I think our height changed the game. All of us was tall, so the girls was like, you a rapper or a basketball player? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that was like, I was like crazy because when we stand next to Tupac and Ice Cube and all them, we were like seven foot over them. You know what I'm saying? It was like, so the girls really knew like, 
well, who them dudes is? Like, you know, in the day, they want to know who we was. Me, C, and Silk, it was like, <laughs> them dudes like giants. <laughs> but it was crazy because at the time, not too many rappers was, was tall like us. So, you know, it, it, but it was good though. I mean, it was good with the women. They, they, they loved us when we came. It was like, I mean, some say they thought we was basketball players. Well, you were. Yeah, I was. <laughs> but that's what I started. Now people don't know, like, I, I started in basketball. And my life, my life could have been different. Been a lot of tragedies. So I was telling people, my first day of going to college, so my senior year, I go shoot dice with my cousin in a project. Some guys that went to school with me, about eight of them, they came up and tried to, they, they tried to rob us. So I took the money, I threw it up in the air. My cousin, he was the man at the time, hot boy, and I told him, so that's where all the hot boy stuff, I said, hot boy, these dudes for real, but he was the OG. I'm saying, cuz, we need to run, we need to go. But they had both sides of the thing surrounded, so I decided to run up the stairs. I ran up the stairs because I couldn't go. They was both ways. The hallway was pitch dark. So I shook the door and laid down. As I laid down, they shot the door. Ba -da 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 -da. I could hear them laughing. I got pee. Come downstairs to get my cousin. They shot him about seven or eight times. So I jumped in the car and took him to the, to the hospital. Dropped him off at the hospital. So at the same time, we, when he got well, we looking for him. We never found him. And then Cousin like, man, you need to go to school, do something with your life. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, I'm thinking I'm going to make it in basketball. So I get to school the first day, they find them. And they, they end up getting all eight of them. And it's like, I went to school, they went to prison. And I, I feel like I've been blessed ever since. I feel like God had a different path for me. So I mean, that's, people don't know the struggle that we done been through. So I salute anybody that get something else and can make it out. You know, people even criticize, oh man, you used to hustle. Yeah, I used to hustle, I did all that. But that ain't what I wanted to do. If I got a better shot, a better chance in life, I'm gonna do something else with it. And, that, and that's what I'm doing. So, you know, you could stereotype and per perk the finger at me saying I'm this and that. Or, I'm not, I'm just a ghetto kid with a second chance that gonna make the best of it for, for my kids. And that's, that's what I changed my life for. You know, people can change their life. I changed my life for my kids. I can't, I realize I can't save everybody, you know? And even if the people that, that are kin to me that don't want nothing out of life, I'm gonna show them tough love and love them from a distance, you know? I mean, I'm not gonna let nobody bring me down what I'm doing if I'm trying to do right. So, yeah. I don't know if people remember, that was Little Romeo that opened that album. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Romeo was a thug, man. Let me tell you, I was just telling somebody, you know, you know how life changed? So one of my boys, his son got killed. His name, Victor. Romeo, him and his son used to fight. Like, they, I'd be like, Rome, you can whoop him. Go ahead, you know. Rome get up and then duke it out with him. I go buy him some jaws. My head was screwed up back then, man. And I start looking at like, what am I doing making my son? But I'm really trying to make him tough. For, for we live in a project. We didn't know he was going to make it this far. Roman did a lot of fighting in the project that he don't, he done got older and be like, man, you go to night nice school now. Good thing we jumped in that car and left and went to California because we'd have been dead on in prison. You know, my grandmother told me, say, I should ride Romeo with me. You know, because when you, you a hood dude and you making money, you got, that's my first son, you taking him everywhere. And I'm, man, I'm hitting Rome. You better be tough. Don't let nobody punk you. You know, and I'm looking at them saying, but God did something. It made me look at him and say, man, if I don't want to die, and watch this kid grow up or, or turn this kid out to be something negative, I need to get my life together and leave, you know? And I told a lot of my homies that, and I, that was the best thing I ever did, because I, you know, my son grew up to be something, something incredible, you know? And a lot of my other friends, they kids dead on in prison, you know? And I look at Rome all the time, I say, dude, Turned out to be a nice dude, but boy, you you could <laughs> you could have went either way. You know what I'm saying? Cause he was tough at the time. Y'all, if y'all look at Rome, Rome was always had the breads. He was he was a gangster. He was like in the making, and you know that's what God do is like. And then I say, you know what? Let me make sure this kid go to school, get education, give him better than what I had. You know, and I mean that's what did it for me. I just jumped up, left the project, went to California. And everything else changed after that. I never knew what was out there waiting for me, but I, I went for it, you know, yeah. What were your first impressions of uh, 
Slim and Baby and Cash Money when they started up well, around that time? You know, at that time, I could have signed everything that was with Cash Money. Everybody. Um, you know, Baby just was a hustler. He was trying to make it. And, you know, at that time, you know, by me being from the Cali, or them being from the Magnolia, like uh, one of my little homies had got killed. So it was like we never could do nothing because I always thought it was something dealing with somebody from that side of the game at that time. Not them specifically, but the dudes out that hood over there. You know what I'm saying? So I, I never could really do nothing with them. That basically was it. But I always, I mean, I saluted them, you know. Salute their success. They, they success. Salute whatever they was doing. I mean, it was beautiful. They, we all from New Orleans. I think it's a beautiful thing, you know. Um, but we never really had a relationship or nothing like that. It just it never was from two different places. I mean, just in a hip hop context, you know, the MCs tend to be competitive, especially right. back then. Right. You know, um, was ever a, 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 did it ever feel competitive, competitive to put out like the best music, most popular music? Did oh you, no! Did I you mean, to be really honest with you, I feel like at that time it was no competition. I mean, they was everybody was chasing us, so it was like I never felt like that. You know. I did whatever I wanted to do. I mean, I wanted to go to the NBA. I went to the NBA. I, I felt like I did everything I needed to do. But at that time, you got to realize you don't know the NBA is politics. So my music, when I was in Charlotte, I was the biggest draw. In my line for fan day, I had 10,000 people. Everybody else might have five people, 10 people. I was actually there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and you see in the game, you see me play, I did what I need to do, I handle my business. Uh, but at that time, the, the, the GM of the team was Bob Bass, he was an older guy. So he didn't know why I wasn't scared of Andy Mason. So, you know, he couldn't believe it. He like, this guy is so big, P, why is you not afraid of him? I said, he's just a person. Even though I liked him, he's cool, but he, you know, he got at me one time, God bless the day, but he got at me, he was like, look, dog." After the after practice, I'm gonna beat you up. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> so I slapped him again when he was going up, cause I was fouling back then. I'm like, man, you go to the basket, I'm gonna let you have, it. cause everybody was scared of him. So I just did it just to see what he was gonna do. So you know how big this dude was. So we get in the shower, was getting ready to go get dressed. I'm waiting for him. I said, you ready? What's up, big dog? What's happening? He said, little man, you crazy, man. Just let go ahead, man. We gonna we cool. <laughs> so we end up being friends after that, but. He couldn't understand. He come, then he come back to me, the GM, he said, look, man, you're a hell of a player, but your music is pure filth. That's why he let me go. I said, that's cold blood. And I'm like, all right, but the fans went crazy. I said, he had to deal with it, you know, and that's what it was. He, I don't know, he listened to my records. It really seemed what that was. He was like, nah. <laughs> so it was crazy. Yeah, you balled out that preseason, though, man. Yeah. The stats were solid. Yeah. The real, real yeah. solid. You know, with Bobby Fields, that was my homeboy. Rest in peace. He's another one. You know, real dude. You know, but I was out there at that time. So sometimes money could take you down, man. You know, those guys, like, they'll bring cars over there to us, Porsches, whatever. Here, man, y'all take which one y'all want and sign off. I'm like, man, I'm good. So as soon as... Uh, B. Fields and your boy David, they, 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 got the, they got them calls, man, they started speeding. And I was supposed to be with them at that time. I told them, man, they drove fast with me. I said, man, drop me back off at the hotel, because I'm living in a hotel. You know, I'm like, I ain't buying no house and none of stuff to make this thing. <laughs> so I'm living in a hotel. Man, they used to drive so fast, and it, it, was, it was just a tragedy, man, when that man lost his life. It was like, I couldn't believe it. Because it was like every day we balled out, did what we had to do, you know, and it's crazy.